Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll briefly take a few minutes to introduce you to a novel from West Africa written by Flora Nawaba, and a, a famous Nigerian author entitled Ifuru. Now, Ifuru, in my opinion, is probably one of the best womanist and feminist novels, which was published in 1966, and it was actually the first novel published by a Nigerian female author. The story revolves around the life of the main character, Ifuru, who from the very beginning of the novel is represented to us as unusual, beautiful, smart, intelligent, and independent. Okay. Now, the very beginning of the novel is about her most autonomous action, and that is that she has moved into her husband Azidu's house, who's poor. She herself is the daughter of a tribal elder and comes from a very established family, but she, without seeking permission from her father, without following the traditions of the groom offering a bride price, has just eloped with the person she loves and gotten married. So that automatically teaches us that she is capable of making her own decisions, but also she's very diplomatic. When her father sends his men to convince her to come back, I mean, she uses the custom and tradition to entertain them in a way that they even forget that they were there to convince her to come back. So Ifuru is a combination of an autonomous native woman, but who also remains within the confines, not confines, but determining factors of her own culture, but uses them for the expression of her own self-identity. That's why I called it a womanist novel because it relies on the native traditions of female autonomy and she creates her space within that. Now the plot is, you know, she gets married, she has a daughter, right? The daughter gets ill when she's two and dies. Her husband, who's not really very reliable, leaves her, marries someone else and the furu, instead of living with that, decides to leave him and goes back to her father, ha father's house. And that's another aspect of the culture where you can return to your family in the time of your need. And her father accepts her back with love. She marries again to another person who she had kind of known since her childhood. And he's a convert. His name, his Christian name is Gilbert and he has had some education. And they have a happy marriage in the beginning, but sadly that marriage also ends in he, you know, marrying other women and expecting her to live with that, which she absolutely refuses to do. Now, Ifuru is also self-sufficient. She's a wonderful, successful businesswoman, and she's very generous to her community, right? Because of which she's loved and respected. Now, after she leaves her second husband, she then lives independently. And she then kind of relies on a local myth of a local lake goddess, Ohamiri, who famously is an independent goddess and who grants all your wishes except children, right? But people pray to her. And in a way, by the end of the novel, Ifuru kind of becomes Ohamiri. She has no children of her own, but she ref refuses to love a man and fall in love with anyone or even live with a man for her own sustenance because she is self-sufficient. Now, I've taught this novel several times and my students always find it fascinating. So what the novel enables me to do is it enables me to feature an African, West African story with a protagonist who's living during the colonial times, but the colonial law and the colonial life is on the fringes of it. All we get is a purely African story with a complex and uh, autonomous African female protagonist, right? And that's what is crucial for our students, let's say in the United States, to have 
to have African character characters in African stories who live by their own culture but also sometimes defy it and who don't absolutely depend on whatever the colonizers bring in to articulate a new kind of self, right? And so the novel creates a space within the culture in which Ifuru grew up, which is the Ibo culture, by the way, to create her own destiny in very individual terms, but through her industry. And that industry, she doesn't learn in school. That also comes from the culture, because in Ibo culture, especially in the rural culture, women were known to be good traders and they were known to to do well as market traders and that's exactly what Ifuru does and so in so many ways it can teach our let's say metropolitan students american students not necessarily just peculiar things about the Ibo culture it does teach that but i never use a novel to teach a culture. I don't. I never assume that a novel can carry the burden of an entire culture, so I always request my students to research the mythology, the myth of Ohamiri, who's also called Mama Wata, right? Mama Water, right? And there are different names for the lake goddess. And, but also how the goddess figure creates this space for Ifuru to live a single independent life because she can affiliate herself with the goddess, right? So no one can blame her for not marrying or not having children or, or not living a normal life. So that's roughly where the novel ends, where, you know, she poses, poses the biggest question, you know, why is it that everyone prays to Ohamiri um, and she herself doesn't have any children? the goddess but people ask her for children and for wealth and maybe in a way since symbolically speaking Ohamiri you know Ifuru becomes Ohamiri. Now Flora Nawapa is is a really interesting figure in Nigerian letters right she uh, you know publishes this novel in 1966 goes on to publish so many other novels she was also an educationist right worked in the education department and uh, she never really called herself a feminist in the Western sense of the word, but she obviously was for women's rights and she was a womanist, womanist in a sense that she wanted to articulate and rely on the African modes of independence that the women could claim. And I think Ifuru is a great example of that. Now, another thing that comes across in Ifuru uh, is, a, is a very problematic topic, and that is a female genital mu mutilation, right? I call it that because I believe that that's a practice that ought not to exist anymore. But there, in the beginning of the novel, you don't gloss over it because Ifuru, Ifuru despite the fact that she's independent, also is entrenched in her own culture and before she gives birth or gets pregnant there is a myth about getting pregnant without having had your circumcision so she decides to do that another thing that the novel teaches us is is the community that the women build together ifuru her mother-in-law her mother-in-law's sister these are all the women who might have their own politics or their own way of looking at life, but by and large, other than a few gossips here and there, you can see a very strong sense that the women do form different kind of support groups. Now, they are complicated characters, so we shouldn't just exoticize them and think that they are live, they all live happily without any conflicts. The conflicts are there in the novel, but you can see that there is a certain degree of understanding and respect for each other and that women support each other. Uh, another thing that the novel can teach you is just simply how Noapa uses different modes of representation to explain different customs. You know, what to do when your daughter-in-law has had a child, how many days does she rest, right? And then what is a ritual for her to reintroduce back into the community? You learn that. Uh, you also learn about the four days in Ibo culture, four days of the week, and each one of is named after a market day. 
these are some of the things that you can learn from the novel. Overall, I mean, uh, most people are very familiar with another Nigerian author, of course, Chinua Achebe, and Things Fall Apart. No, remember, Things Fall Apart came out, I think, in 1952. But Ifurukam came out in 1966, and I think as a cultural masterpiece, as an act of representing a specific West African culture, which is now in Nigeria, I think Ifuru is one of the most significant novels. So I hope this encourages you to look for the novel and read it. And, uh, and if you are a professor or a teacher, I encourage you to teach it. Um, the way I teach it is that I give my students uh, presentation assignments where they go and research one aspect of the novel. Some of them go and research local customs, Ibo cultural history, then they go and research the mythologies that are invoked in the novel, like the Uhamiri and others. Uh, and then as groups, as they represent, uh, present those, what I've noticed is that they become sort of my core groups who give their opinions when we discuss a certain part of the novel. So I would certainly recommend that you should do something like that. But as I said earlier, I never make the mistake of assuming that one novel can carry the burden of an entire culture. But if you want a novel from West Africa, written by a Nigerian author, that gives you a strong female character, a character who sustains tragedy, who's resilient, and who decides how she is going to live a life, this is the novel for you. So thank you for joining me, and if you read the novel, do let me know what you think about it. Do let, you, let me know in the comment section if this was useful to you. And, uh, or if you have any questions, if you would like me to elaborate a little more. So that's all I have. Uh, in my, this is in my series on introducing fiction books. Please do check the series itself. I will post an end screen there and you can click on it and watch it. And please do so. Thank you so much. And I will now see you next time with a video on some other topic related to post-colonialism and post-colonial space. Until then, thank you, and as always, peace and love.